morning, we're going to we finish up the book of Titus after a good year of looking at it, and it's just such a blessing of now we get to live it out together and just seeing what the Lord has done in our midst. I'm watching some amazing things of how you're engaging in families and one another, couples, singles, just beautiful what God is doing. You're not being hearers of the word only, but doers, and your pastor's very encouraged. So now bathe it all in prayer and ask God to start the fires of revival. So this morning, one more time to preach before I leave town, I wanted to uh, take a look um, to shepherd you in what's really been happening in our country, and in particular with the election and the breakdown of our society, we're seeing rioting, growing hostility to Christian thought and principle in our very nation. It's unprecedented in the times that, we, that I've been alive. I've never seen anything like this. It's not unprecedented for the world, though, for most of the world and even the history of the world. The emotion that's been swirling around that I've been talking with and meeting is that of fear. I'm hearing, I, I fear terrorists. I'm fearing jihad, uh, the liberal agenda, the deterioration of a nation morally where we've reversed uh, right and wrong. Our economy and future jobs, we have a lot of college students who, who are looking and saying, what, what is going to happen when I graduate? We have a weakened military in, in the strengthening of dangerous regimes throughout the world. We have a growing enmity toward tolerating Christian thought, and there's a persecution that's arising. I call it the intolerance of tolerance. It's an industrialized society with health concerns and all leading to just a great fear of the future. And so I want to help you this morning to overcome fear. The fear of a society that's closing in on us as Christians the fear of what Jesus is asking us to do, the very last words that he left to the church is therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all things that I have commanded. And so there's the commission to the church. We have been called to go, to take this message, to build into others and bring the truth of Jesus Christ. And so as we do that, we're now engaging in a very hostile culture. And I want us to not pull away from society because it's worsening. That's the temptation. But to obey Jesus Christ and to enter right into it with the gospel and without fear. And in this passage today, I want you to find some answers that can help with all, all the fear that you might be battling as you've come in this morning. And so I want every child of God to walk out of here with your fears comforted and to have them driven out. Just full trust and confidence in the God of the universe who just happens to be your father. And so I want to go before God because this is a lofty desire uh, that every fear of every child of God would be driven out with, with just nothing left but fear of God sitting there in love and reverence for him. So let's go to our God and ask his blessing on our time in this word. Father, we come before you and we do live in turbulent times they're different than what most of us have lived in and so father the natural reaction of the flesh is to fear Lord, to be anxious I know there are many sitting here with trials uh, in their families and trials without and lots of difficulties and pressures and so Lord I just pray that your spirit by your truth would drive out fear Lord, that perfect love would cast out all fear and that what would be left is just holding the sovereign of the universe who is our Father and who is for us and is our God. Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty work in our midst. There are fears here that only your spirit and your word can heal. And so we look to you to do that in our midst this morning. God, that you would make bold and courageous followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would not hide from this society, but we would engage it with the name above all names, with the message above all messages. God, I pray. Give us boldness and courage in these days to make known the sweet name of Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of our Father. Amen. If you turn with me then to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is where we'll be looking. And our, our secretary here at the church, when she asked what I was preaching on, I told her Matthew 10, and she said, is it a three-part series? The answer is no. I only got one week. And so there's a, it's a beautiful context, is that Jesus Christ has been promised for thousands of years, and now he has come into the world. 
He's been born in from the seed of David, and he shows he's from the seed of Abraham, the one that we have been looking for. This is the Lord's Messiah. And he comes into the world, and he begins preaching the kingdom of God. It is here. It is upon you. And he shows them that the kingdom has come by power over sickness. He's healing diseases by power over nature. He's calming storms, power over demons and casting them out, and even power over death. In chapter 10, he's now sending out his disciples on their very first missionary journey. Their evangelism is to go now through the surrounding region, and he gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And they are to go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And so as Jesus is about to send them out, he's given them kind of a briefing. Uh, we see this in military battles. The briefing was so important because they didn't have cell phones and the like, so you had to understand the whole battle as you went out. So the briefings wanted to accomplish two main things. To define reality, they would open up a map, and then they would look at all the terrain, where the enemy is going to come, where will we battle, where will the fights take place. And then the second part was the moral dimension where a leader would try to get them in the right state of mind and heart and courageous as they now go and enter into battle. Look with me in verse 5. These twelve then, his apostles, Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any cities uh, of the Samaritans. So here's your briefing now. You're being sent out. The words that follow in the rest of this chapter are how Jesus pre, uh, briefed the disciples as they were being sent out. And we're going to look at some of the details this morning. First, he says, you're going to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. Do things then that show the power of the kingdom. He tells his disciples, don't worry about any provision, for the worker is worthy of his support. Cities will receive you if they do, give them blessing. And the cities that don't, shake even the dust off your feet. Look with me in verse 16. Behold, then I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and as innocent of doves. Beware of men, they'll hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogue. So you're going to go out as sheep in the midst of wolves. They're going to arrest you by the authorities. They're going to scourge you, and you'll be brought before governors and kings. Jump down to verse 21. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father even his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 22. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is not enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, which is the devil, how much more will they malign the members of his household? What a briefing, huh? He didn't, he didn't say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He didn't say, seek me and I'll make you healthy, wealthy, and wise, as we hear from many pulpits even in our country. He didn't say, come to me and I will make your life easier. This is what Jesus has promised to those who want to follow after him. This is what he promised as we take seriously the great commission that he left to the church of God. This is the briefing of the disciples. What would this do for you? What, what does it do as you, as you watch our government and society starting to close in around us? They're starting to hate us. I mean, their hatred is starting to come out more and more. It used to just be internal, and it's more and more being voiced. It, it is not safe or in. It, it is, it's in now to persecute Christians in our very country. And so what does that do when we get our briefing? Because we are told this. The emotion that must have come over these disciples is the one that I'm seeing as well and feeling at times in my own heart is that of fear. And so what's coming over them, be afraid. They're going to beat you and they're going to want to put you to death and you're going to get dragged in by governors and courts as you go out and preach this message. So the emotion that overcomes them is fear. And so the rest of this briefing is Jesus getting these men into the right state of mind and the right state of heart, trying to to take away their fear. So to prepare them for what they're about to embark upon. And so let's turn our attention now to the Prince of Peace who wants to bring peace to troubled hearts and fearful souls. And it's my prayer that he would do the same for your hearts 
that are full of fear with what is going on in our society even this morning. So let's take up in verse 26. Therefore, therefore, what is the therefore? In light of all that's going to come against you, disciple, all of the opposition, all the persecution, all of the hatred, he says, do not fear them. Look at verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body. Verse 31. So do not fear, for you are more value, valuable than many sparrows. And so now Christ is saying, don't fear. Don't be afraid. How? That's a real nice command. I like it. Don't fear them. Okay, I'll, I'll do that, right? I'm just going to run out and not fear. How's that work for you this morning? <laughs> that, didn't, that doesn't do much. I remember when I was a little kid playing Little League football. And I was in sixth grade, and our coach had the brilliant idea of scrimmaging the eighth graders. And they had, most of them had puberty going for them already. And so picture a little sixth grader scrimmaging the eighth graders in football. I was absolutely terrified, and the coach said, don't be afraid. Did nothing for me. <laughs> nothing. I need more than that. How do you overcome fear? You need something greater than what you're fearing to overcome fear. When I was going off to seminary, my brother Steve, in his kindness, let me come live with him and his family. The, the only problem in the basement is he had spiders that just dropped down all the time. And I remember my wife's greatest fear is spiders. And I was in my room and I heard this screaming. I thought someone was killing her. And I came running into the bathroom and there was this little spider hanging in there and she was terrified. But you know what happened? Big bad Ken came in the bathroom and something greater than that spider was there and it just, boom, killed it. And her fears were relieved because something greater than what she was afraid of was there. <laughs> Another thing that really helps with fear is to know that it's all going to work out and that the truth is all going to be made known. And it's Because there's times where people are deceiving, they're lying, they're slandering you. And there, there's a day when everything's going to be made known would help. And another biggie with fear is when there's someone protecting you. Someone who says, I got your back. Uh, that, that person is really able to protect you. I, I've shared, I think, this before as well. But I, when I was a little kid, I was walking out of a football game. And there was these high school kids kind of bullying. And they were picking on me. And I was terrified. And as I was walking out, my dad just grabbed my hand. And we walked by him. They didn't say a word. I just I felt so comforted because I had my dad. And another way to overcome fear is to have that person who can protect you. So in Jesus' briefing, I want to see how he prepares and helps his disciples overcome fear that is rising up in their hearts. So look with me. Our first point in verse 26 and 27 is the truth will be made known. Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. So right now, it looks like the, the wolves are winning. They're destroying. They're coming. ISIS is beheading Christians, and they're persecuting them all over. The world is abusing Christians. It looks like they're winning. And Jesus tells his disciples, one day, there's a day coming when all truth will be made known. Currently, we're looked down upon, we're mocked, we're ridiculed, we're called prudes, we're thought foolish, we're sneered at by even our own families. The world appears to be having fun in all of their externals and all of their, their, their frivolity. The wicked look like they're prospering, and it's hard, but Jesus is telling this little band of disciples that one day, one day everything will be exposed for what it is. The world will finally understand truth and all of its reality and all of its truth. We will be vindicated and we will not be the fools any longer. Enemies will be shown what they have done to us, who they persecuted, their motives, and how they will be punished for it for all of eternity. And the righteous will be shown what they have done and who persecuted them and how they will be rewarded for all of eternity. It's all going to be revealed one day, guys. And right now we look like fools. The world beats and kills and ridicules us for being followers of Jesus Christ. But the truth is one day going to be is going to reign and everything will be made known. Jesus says what is now concealed will be revealed. 
what has been hidden will be made known. We are not vindicated yet. We may even have to die, but he says one day it's all going to be made known. Are you struggling with a great injustice this morning because of your faith? Maybe a spouse divorcing you for your faith, making you look like a fool in court in the eyes of your friends and your family, whatever it would be. This perspective will enable a disciple to confront society with the claims of Jesus Christ we, we, while anticipating our reward in eternity. And when all truth is made plain and evident to the entire universe, it will be shown to be a true one. John Calvin, he was banished from Geneva for preaching the truth. He said, if we had served men, we should have been ill rewarded. But we serve a great master who will recompense us. Every knee is going to bow. And we will reign victorious with Christ and all truth is going to be made known. So I cheated. I have said this before. I peeked at the back of the book. And at the end, we're going to win. And all truth is going to be made real. And right now, you're ridiculed and mocked and persecuted. And it gets hard and difficult. But I want your fear to, to go away because all truth is going to be made known in Jesus Christ on that last day. Secondly, God is the highest authority. He's greater than anything that we fear. So look with me in verse 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So he says, now go, go speak of it. What, what I tell you in darkness, what I have taught you, Jesus says, now go speak in the light. And darkness here, as Jesus is talking, is, is about in the secrecy, in our intimate times, in our intimate settings, I have been teaching you in the upper room, in the hillside, on a boat, on a dusty trail, in intimacy, I've been teaching you about the kingdom of God. And so what I have told you in private has been hidden from the world. Now, go speak in the light. Go take this truth and tell it to the world. Let it get out. One of my favorite songwriters put it this way. Go tell it on the mountain, tell it to the world, shout it to the rich man, yell it to the hurt. Don't keep it to yourself. Go spread his good word. Go tell it on the mountain all night long. God has come to save the world. He has sent his only son. Go tell it on the mountain. Go preach this. Go proclaim it. It's not enough to just study it and learn it and sit around and talk about it. All of our studies in the secret place and quiet. Jesus says, now go speak it in the light. Go speak it in the open. Speak it in the day. Reveal the truth of Jesus Christ. This is not the family secret. Proclaim it. Jesus is what you hear whispered in your ear. Proclaim on the housetops. What is whispered in your ear again is close proximity. It's the intimate setting. It's whispered because you're so closely connected. He has taught them in intimacy and closeness. And what do we do with his teaching? You proclaim it on the housetop. So do we just sit up on housetops and, hey, you? That's not what he's getting at. The housetop was a flat roof in that day with little short walls all the way around it. And it was where you, some people would sleep up there and you would do your eat and you would do your entertainment up on the rooftop. And if there was ever an announcement that needed to be made, you stood on your rooftop and you proclaimed it to the whole city. You would just stand and shout from your rooftop. And so here it is, go tell it from the mountain. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God to bring men, women, and children into salvation. This is a call to take truth to your world, your environment, where you live, your school. This is your calling. You're a learner, a disciple meant to learn what Jesus taught, and now go preach it on the housetops. I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul, who I think got this better than anyone. He writes this uh, in Acts 20. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and Paul called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. He was being abused and persecuted as he was teaching. And in light of that, I did not shrink from declaring on the housetops to you anything that was profitable. 
and teaching you publicly from house to house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. You're going to get the tar beat out of you. You're going to get pounded. You're going to get thrown in prison. Why are you going to go? I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish my course in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God, to go make known gospel of Jesus Christ at any cost, no matter what comes upon me, I will go. What I've had whispered in my ear, I proclaim on the housetops. And so here this disciples, learners and followers, we all have been given a responsibility to proclaim what we have had whispered in our ears by Jesus Christ. Moms and dads, offices, church, neighborhood, family get-togethers, world, schools, friends, uh, this is our calling to make this known. But they might want to kill me. I've seen the look in some of their eyes, and, and it's hostile. And I'm, I'm not going to make friends doing this. If I do this, I'm going to be in great da danger, maybe even to the point of death. And that's really verse 28. <clears throat> do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body. And hell. As you proclaim this message, people will try to kill you, Jesus is telling them. Do you see how he wasn't softening his message as we're trying to do today to soften Jesus' message? He wasn't teaching them um, how, how to get the world to like you. Jesus tells them, don't fear. Go preach this truth. And don't fear. Why, Jesus? The worst they can do is kill you. That's not real encouraging at this point. I was hoping for just a little bit more encouragement than that. They're going to kill you. But listen to what he says. This is so powerful and I believe needed to our day. Don't be con so concerned about what dies, but rather what lives. Come on. Be more concerned about the eternal soul that lives forever than these bodies that are going to die. Your eternal soul. Everything is about the material, but for the believer it's the immaterial. Fear the greater issue is what Jesus is saying, like the one who's able to destroy both soul and body and hell. There's something so much greater to fear than those who can persecute us and ridicule us and maybe even kill us. There's something greater to fear than what we're afraid of. And that's the one who can kill both body and soul and hell. The creator of all, the Lord of all, who can kill both body and soul in an eternal hell is way worse than someone who can just kill my body. So Jesus says, fear him more, for he can throw your body and soul into Gehenna. This word for Gehenna is an interesting word. It was the name of the city dump in the valley of Hinnon, which was just outside Jerusalem. And this was a place where criminals, if they didn't have a place to be buried, they would put them in that city dump. The worms would be there and, and the ravaged dogs would come and feed on all the garbage. And every once in a while, they would light it to burn it to get rid of all of that stuff. It's probably the most vivid, crucial, gross thing that you could think of in the day. And Jesus grabs that and says, fear him who can kill both body and soul in Gehenna. Every so often, uh, Jesus chooses that picture for hell. Jesus says, fear that authority more than men. Today, we fear men more than God. We fear men more than God. And yet there have been millions who have feared God more than men throughout church history. Do you know the men that he's talking to right now are going to go die deaths of martyrdom? They're going to they're all be killed except John, who's going to be put in branding oil and later exiled to Patmos. And then early on the church, Nero's going to become king, and he's crucifying Christians and burning them as lights at his parties. Then the early church, the persecution keeps spreading, and we have the catacombs, which are 600 miles underground, and it's estimated to have 4 million bodies that were martyred for the King Jesus in those. Then you come and you move into the Reformation, where people were again being killed for their faith. There, there were Bloody Mary who was killing many. 
Today we have ISIS. There are more martyred today than at any point in the history of the world. Right now as we speak. And so the question is, do we have this kind of fear? Is that what drives our heart? I'm done fearing men. I fear the living God. And so I will go out and I will shout on the rooftops that he is risen. He is alive. And he's a savior. And he's able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. What a cure for fear. There's something way greater to fear than man. And it's God. I fear not proclaiming his name in gospel more than being punished and persecuted and killed for the name of Jesus Christ. And that a powerful point that Jesus brings to our hearts this morning. One of the early uh, church fathers, Justin Martyr, said they can kill us, but they cannot hurt us. They can kill us, but they cannot hurt us. Thirdly, to overcome fear, look with me in verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. That's beautiful. <laughs> this, is, this helps with fear so much with the future and everything that you're facing right now. As I walk into the future, as I go into a society that hates me, I can go in with no fear because the God of the universe, the sovereign one that speaks and worlds are made, he governs every detail in his hand. The hand of providence is over every one of our lives. This one cares for his children. And Jesus pulls this illustration of a sparrow, which just filled Palestine. It was the most common bird in all of Palestine. It says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? In Luke 12, 6, Jesus said, are not five sparrows sold for two cents? So if you buy two sparrows for a penny, you get them. And if you buy four, you get an extra one thrown in for free. Two, two pennies. That's how cheap these little sparrows were. And so you've got to figure this out. It's just a common bird that was just everywhere and not a big deal in Palestine. And such a common little bird. Jesus says, yet not one of them can sit on a little perch or tree and fall to the ground apart from God's providence, apart from his notice and his will and his decree. Not, a, not even a little sparrow is outside of God's providence and his watch and his provision. How is anyone going to persecute you and kill you apart from God's notice? In verse 30, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. The point is the detail to, to notice that God the Father takes of us, it's unreal. The psalmist says, when I awake, I'm amazed I'm still with you. Such intimacy and knowledge that God has with us. He says, don't fear. God has you. He's working for your good. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who have been called according to his purpose. We, we know this. Nothing escapes his notice with people who are hating you and persecuting you and trying to kill you, it's not outside his notice. Henry Martin, the great missionary to India, he said, I am immortal until my work is done. Nothing can hurt me or touch me until God says done. There's a peace. I don't need to fear. Doesn't that make you feel a little bit radical? I can't die a second earlier than God decreed. He has me. He's got me in his life. I don't need to fear. God watches over a sparrow in verse 31, so do not fear, fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. I gave my son to redeem you. Aren't you worth more than many sparrows to God? Don't be afraid. God's your father. He watches over the big, big things and he watches over little things like the hair on your head. G. Campbell Morgan was a famous preacher and someone asked him, is it okay, pastor, to ask God about the small things in life. And he said, everything in your life is small to God. <clears throat> he can take care of every detail. It's easy. He, he, he spared not his own son. How much easier now to take care of all of your needs that you have. So whatever you are facing this morning with fear, Jesus says, don't fear. You're more value to me than many sparrows. I care about you. I'm the sovereign one and I'm your father, don't, don't be afraid if God is your father. 
I gotta, I'm got to hurry up this morning, so I'm just going to read kind of the rest of the chapter. Uh, look with me then in verse 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, which I think is in the context of persecution, when we're being persecuted like this day and age, the one who will confess me before men, who will not back away from the name that is above every name, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever, because of all this persecution, just shuts up, is afraid, and doesn't speak, who denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. <coughs> do not think, listen to this real carefully, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I think some people don't even understand that. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. This name is going to divide families. And we're taught from early on that if you do everything right, all your kids are going to be Christians and everything's going to be simple and easy. And I, I, I hate to rain on your parade, but Jesus Christ just said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And in your very families, if you hold up the name of Jesus Christ, there are going to be some that are going to hate you. Even, even your, possibly your own mother, your own son. And he's saying to, that there is something above every family tie, and it's the name of Jesus Christ. I, I put him above everything. This idol, this idolatry that reigns supreme today, family above Christ. I put Christ above everything. And it may bring division right into your very homes. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me, he's not worthy of me. And he who has found his life in this world is going to lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. These are some powerful words <coughs> by Jesus Christ. Mark Twain said, it's not the verses in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the ones that I do. And what we're looking at this morning, there are some powerful verses that what it means if we're really going to follow after Jesus Christ. So I'm tired of this watered-down Christianity that says you just need Jesus and you can live any way you want and nothing else matters. Jesus himself is saying you can't be my disciple if you don't take your cross and die. And if you don't make me the supreme person in all of your life, you'll, you can't be my disciple. And we're to, we're to love this name and treasure it above every name. And we're to engage this world with this gospel of Jesus Christ, who's a savior. And we're going to enter it at, at any cost of persecution and rejection and hatred and even to the point of death. Because this name has come to mean everything to me. And there, there's no cost that is too great for Jesus Christ. Because there was no cost too great for him in saving my soul. And because of that, I'm willing to lose anything and everything for the sweet name of Jesus Christ. So don't be afraid if you have Christ. Amen? Amen? My heart, as the United States is changing so quickly, is that the persecution is going to come, and it's mounting and it's growing right now. And will we fulfill what Christ has commissioned us to do without fear? I want to engage it without being afraid of this world. And as we're going to go to the table now and remember Jesus Christ, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is that perfect love casts out all fear. And Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, bearing the, the justice and the wrath of God for our sins so that we could be forgiven is the highest that love could ever go. And it's a, it's a perfect love. And so to realize now I am perfectly loved by God, it drives out every fear. 
There, there, there's no other way to get rid of fear, to drive it out. It isn't to just sit in your mind and reason and think through things. It, it's to know this perfect love. I am in the perfect love of God in Christ Jesus. I, I'm indestructible. I'm, I'm untouchable. And it just drives out every fear, the fear of judgment. I can now die and stand in the presence of God. And there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't even have to fear death. This perfect love drives out every fear. Anything you're afraid of here, the love of Christ should just drive it out. Get it out of your hearts as we come to the table and see the perfect love of God in Christ Jesus. And remember that there's absolutely no fear then for the one who has this. And so I encourage you, if you've never come to this Christ, if you've come to America's Christ where you don't have to take up a cross, that's not going to do you any good on the last day. And so I'm going to ask you here, uh, have you come to Jesus Christ? Have you taken up your cross and said, my life is his, and I'm going to follow the King of Kings the rest of my days? Not perfectly, but with all of my heart. And so if you've never come to Christ, I invite you this morning, even while we're praying and remembering that, that he, you might deal with your soul and think through with him. I pray that we would be fearless in light of Jesus' briefing for us as we go to war for the gospel of Jesus Christ in its advance as we don't need to be afraid. And so to God be the glory. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and pa pass out the communion elements and supplies. I'm going to pray and then we'll have them come forward. So if you're going to usher, why don't you go back now and uh, let's just pray and, and ask God's blessings. Father, I thank you for Matthew chapter 10. God, I thank you for the briefing of Jesus Christ to his disciples, which is to us as his followers. Lord, I pray that um, the commission that you left us, or that it wouldn't land lightly on our hearts, that that would be our life and what we're committed to. God, there are so many things to be afraid of as we carry out uh, this task. And yet the, the loving commander, the king, Lord Jesus, has brought comfort to his disciples as they go out. And so I pray that our hearts would be comforted, that all the truth is one day going to be made known. All those who are persecuting us, all the lies against us, Lord, one day all truth will be made known, that we had the truth and we had you. And Father, we, we pray that we would fear you more than humans, that we would fear nothing with human breath, but that we would fear the living God who has all authority to determine our eternal destination whether we'll spend eternal life with you in blessing and glory for eternity, or whether we'll spend in Gehenna, that awful place, that horrid place that the Son of God described to us forever. God, let that be the greater burden of our soul, is you, you and you alone. Lord, let us never fear little humans. They can do so little to us. God, it is you alone that we reverence and respect and give honor and authority and praise to. Father, we thank you that we are worth uh, more than little sparrows to you. Lord, we thank you that you're our Father and you care about every little detail of our life, even the numbers of hairs on our head. God, I thank you that you love us so intimately. For those who are struggling, going, where are you, Father? Let them see that you're right in the middle of every struggle. You're working to shape them into the image of Jesus Christ. Let them feel that. Let them rejoice in a Father who cares so much about the details of their lives. God, you only bring hardship to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Thank you for perfectly picking, handpicking every trial in our lives and then not just bringing them, but being there with us and carrying us and giving us strength to walk through them. And God, following Jesus, might even divide our own families and we are willing for the name that is above every name. God, we will hold to Jesus in truth at any cost. I thank you for a Savior who's so worthy to lose everything for. He's altogether lovely. He's beautiful. We delight to follow him. Lord, uh, we, we need no chains or, or whips. We are, we are glad slaves. We willingly, joyfully follow him. I thank you for it. I pray now as we come to the table, Lord, that our hearts would be full with this perfect love. Lord, that we would gaze upon the perfect love that you have in Christ Jesus and that every heart would just have all of its fear driven out. Lord, let this memory of Jesus Christ this morning drive out any fear in the body of Christ this morning. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.